All right, everybody, welcome to the third installment of the fifth class. So we've been talking about earthquakes, uh, what they are, how often they occur. And I want to close this class with a third lecture. Actually, we might have a fourth, but I'm not sure, uh, about subduction zone earthquakes. And these are the biggest and the baddest granddaddy earthquakes that you can have. And they also generate tsunamis, as shown in this picture here from the 2011 Japan tsunami. So why do we care about them? There's a whole bunch of reasons, but for now, let's just say they produce the biggest, potentially deadliest earthquakes on Earth. And of course, they also tell us what's happening at this really critical interface between the mantle and the crust, um, and help us understand uh, a lot of aspects of subduction and plate tectonics. So what are we going to cover in this lecture? Um, we'll talk about why subduction zones produce big earthquakes. Then we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of the subduction zone earthquake cycle. And then we'll talk about how tsunamis are generated. So if we look at where Earth's largest earthquakes occur, you can see that they are generally along subduction zones. This is the ring of fire that we identified in a previous lecture on volcanoes, you see it's also the ring of large earthquakes. And again, it's following these subduction zones around the edge of the Pacific. So why are these the biggest quakes on Earth? The answer to that lies in a couple videos ago when we talked about what controls the magnitude or the size of an earthquake. There was a couple things in that equation. One was the surface area of the fault, so the area that slips, and then the distance over which it slips. And subduction zones are ripe for this. Um, for one thing, they are very extensive. We've already seen that subduction zones extend thousands of kilometers along the coast of South America and along the Aleutian Islands up here. So they're basically these incredibly long, continuous thrust faults. Okay, that also happen to be well lubricated by wet sediments going down the subduction zone. So what that means is that once an earthquake starts, it's going to be able to extend and keep going along a long distance of the fault. We also know subduction zones have very high relative plate velocities. So what I mean by that is how fast, for example, the Pacific plate is being subducted under South America. At many subduction zones, that's going to be 4 to 8 centimeters per year, and even a bit higher in some places. So basically, subduction zones are moving really, or places where two plates are moving together really fast. So if we have a lot of area, and we have to accommodate a lot of plate motion, that means we're going to have big earthquakes, and they're going to happen pretty often. So an example of this is. Uh, the 2004 Sumatran earthquake that created a huge tsunami. And this earthquake ruptured 1,400 kilometers. Imagine that, the distance from New York to Atlanta. <laughs> and it started uh, here at this star, kind of off the northern end of Sumatra, and ripped all the way up to Thailand. So looking on this figure, it started right around here and ripped all the way up to Thailand. Um, so that's a huge distance. This figure shows the slip on the subduction zone during the earthquake. Red is where the slip was greatest, the slip distance. Seven and a half meters of slip here. Wow, that's a lot. Tapering off to just maybe a meter up towards Thailand. Imagine moving seven and a half meters in an instant. That's a lot of energy. So that's why subduction zones produce big earthquakes. Let's look at how it actually happens. What's the earthquake cycle look like? So we're going to use this schematic diagram. Um, what this shows, this, this gray is the oceanic crust going down beneath the continental crust here in pink. And we're going to go through a couple of time steps here to illustrate this. So we're going to start out uh, at time one right after a subduction zone earthquake has occurred. So the stress has just been released, but the oceanic plate is still going down at a pretty fast rate. 
Now, importantly, uh, there's two sections of the fault. The shallower depths tend to be locked. The friction along the fault interface tends to be really high. And so the two plates stay locked together until the stresses become really high. In contrast, at deeper depths, the fault plane is slipping. This is usually because it's hotter, and that heat helps to create a lot of volatiles and create a lot of water in the fault zone. And so we end up lubricating the fault zone, and it slips freely at depth. So the basic result of this is that the area under this locked portion literally gets carried down. It's like the overlying crust is getting sucked down in the subduction zone temporarily. But now think about what happens in the overlying crust. It's getting squished again. This is the, this is the elastic strain accumulating again. The spring is loading. And as that gets squished across here, the inland part actually gets pushed up. So we get basically a seesaw effect where the outboard portion of the continental crust gets pulled down and subsides. The inboard portion actually gets pushed up and actually rises. And these two pieces of the seesaw are separated by a hinge line, which is the transition point from where things are going down to where things are going up. And of course, this is all happening slowly over the interseismic period. If you were to live on a little island out here, you would find that slowly over time, your island was actually each year dropping down a couple centimeters lower and lower. And we'll see some evidence for that in a second. And then along comes the earthquake. Here we go. And everything's going to come swinging back in the other direction. Boom. Boom. So you can see the outer part of the crust here is basically being snapped forward during the earthquake. The island comes rebounding vertically back up, and the inner area of the crust comes sinking back down. And once again, uh, we've hit the reset button, and now we're going to start accumulating that strain again and repeat the cycle again. So let's look quickly at some evidence. How do we know this is what happens? And this is miraculous. We can actually see this happening before our very eyes. So I'm going to take you now uh, to the Andaman subduction zone uh, right off uh, Indonesia. So this is the same subduction zone we were just looking at. We're looking at Indonesia north to south here. This is Malaysia over here. And here's a subduction zone running along here. Indian plate is coming in and subducting down below. And these islands are sitting in the part of the crust that is being affected by the seismic cycle. So what happens to these islands during the seismic cycle? Well, during the interseismic period, before the earthquake, we can see that entire palm tree plantations are being pulled down underwater. So this is a palm tree farm that was probably planted 20, 30, 50 years ago. And over time, the whole thing is now being pulled down underwater. Now, after the earthquake, here's that same palm tree plantation. Boom, high and dry. It snapped back a couple meters vertically. And this was a huge earthquake that did this. This was a magnitude 9 earthquake. So looking at that kind of in map view, um, I was lucky enough to be part of a team that actually mapped out uplifted coral reefs along these islands uh, back in the late 2000s. And this is one of the maps. Actually, this was not my group that produced this, but it was produced by a related study. Um, this shows the magnitude of uplift uh, on both sides of the hinge line. So here's the subduction zone here offshore. Here's the hinge line in white. All the contours in yellow show areas that snapped upward in the earthquake, up to a maximum of 2.5 meters. All the areas in blue show areas that sank down during the earthquake. 
So let's have a look again at more evidence of this. So this is offshore uplift. Uh, look at this. This pier is now out of water. All these corals used to be underwater. They've now been popped up out of the water. The old high tide line is way up here. Um, here's another case where you can see uh, this beach is now abandoned by the uplift. And another case where the, the beach has now been abandoned. Now let's go inboard of that hinge line. Let's move away from the subduction zone to where we actually have subsidence or sinking during the earthquake. Here's a flooded forest area. Here's a whole village that has now been flooded by that subsidence. So keep in mind, this whole area was gradually uplifting in the interseismic for about 200 years, maybe, 150 years. This village was built during that time. They had no idea that when the earthquake hit, the land surface was going to drop by a couple meters, and that village is now underwater. There's another shot of that. And here's my friend Rich Briggs surveying um, the inundation line. OK, so let's finish this lecture up and look quickly at how tsunamis are generated. Tsunamis are intimately associated with subduction zone earthquakes. And that's because uh, the whole seafloor moves during the earthquake. So let's take this as the coastline. Let's take this as the subduction zone interface. This is a fault right here. During the earthquake, as we saw, that fault snaps forward. The continental crust snaps forward. And what happens is the whole seafloor also abruptly snaps forward and up. And that displaces the water and creates waves that radiate towards the shore, but they also radiate away from the shore. So the waves go in both directions, towards shore and away from shore. What that means is if you're living right on the shore here, that tsunami is going to reach you in a matter of minutes. But it also means that if you live across the ocean from a subduction zone, tsunami waves can be sent out that might reach you many hours or even days later. So this little figure shows the travel time of tsunami waves from some important subduction zones around the world. So from South America, it would take about 12 hours for that tsunami wave to hit Hawaii. From the Aleutians, it would take about five hours for that tsunami wave to hit Hawaii. Long story short, Hawaii is probably going to get hit by a tsunami sometime soon. OK, so let's close by watching a couple tsunami videos. Again, I'm not able to show you these videos. Within this video, you'll have to go to YouTube and see them yourself. I guarantee it's worth your while. OK, so you can either copy these links or perhaps more easily, you could go. Uh, one of these videos is called New Footage Emerges of Japan Tsunami. You could search that, 2 minutes 41 seconds. The other is called Dramatic New Footage of Japanese Tsunami. That's a minute 8. So check those out. They're, they're worth a look. And I'll leave you, as usual, with the concept questions and uh, a link to a short quiz on this lecture. And I might see you in another lecture about measuring plate velocities with GPS. If not, we'll see you in class six. Thanks a lot, guys.